You might be familiar, at least maybe some of you might be familiar with the name Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is the, been called the, the oracle of Omaha. He is a, a very, very wealthy, well-to-do, successful investor. He is the founder of the Berkshire Hathaway of, you know, companies which are traded on the public stock exchange. And he's considered probably one of the 10 wealthiest men in the world. Not only is he one of the most wealthiest men in the world, last year, 2023, Warren Buffett was, was uh, it, they, they, from all sources we know, from public sources we know, was also the top donor of financial gifts last year. He donated last year to a foundation he established in the name of his first wife, $541 billion of Berkshire Hathaway Class B stock. And even though the stock was valued on the day that they put in the foundation, it was valued at that amount of money, that placed him on the roster as the top financial giver, at least from the standpoint of all, all charitable organizations, for, for 2023. Not far behind him was a man that probably most of us wouldn't even know his name or pay attention to him. He's a, he's a, he's a mathematician, a whiz of a mathematician. Uh, he, because of that, he did very well in investing and became a hedge fund founder. And his name is James Simon. And James and Marilyn Simon came close to Warren, uh, Warren Buffett. They came in at being sec the second largest donor, giving $500 million to the Simons Foundation, which basically was established to help uh, fund uh, the Stony Brook University in New York to help the university's endowment and other, other causes they have there. But when you think about these two men and all the other list of people that Forbes or Fortune, whoever it may be, they list as the top donors. Again, we think about those numbers. I don't know about you, but for me, those are mind staggering numbers. Numbers. When you talk about billions, it's like I, it's hard to get my mind wrapped around billions and millions in, like, in, the, in that capacity there. But when you think about money, people that give like that, to them, it's a large amount of money to us, but those men gave of what the Bible calls of their abundance. They gave, but they still have a lot more money. And what they gave may be, uh, may be, just, uh, may be just, like, just a small percentage of what they're really worth. And it may be like if someone, if someone here in the room, you made $1,000 of interest last year in your savings, it's like giving $100 off that because it didn't really cost you much more. It was just money. I mean, to them, they gave an abundance of their giving. Would you notice our passage this morning? Jesus is contrasting two types of givers, one who gave of their abundance and one who gave her all. Does the thought of giving everything you have cause you fear? Does it make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Because frankly, when it comes to money, all of us are private. All of us are a little bit, you know, we, there's some subjects when it comes to money we don't really feel very comfortable in talking about. But talking about money and seeing about money, money and how we handle our money, what we do with money, says a lot about us. It says a lot about our heart. It says a lot about our integrity. It says a lot about our motives. Money does talk. Money does talk. Uh, last year they, they recorded Americans spent $349 billion on fast food. So if you go to In-N-Out, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, I guess that's fast food, amen, you know. Um, Raising Cane's, whatever it may be, yeah. You're part of the fast food empire. You have contributed 349 or $350 billion. Uh, last year, Americans spent more than that with Amazon.com. Americans spent $395 billion through Amazon. Do you know how much they gave to charities last year? The sum total that Americans, including to churches, gave to charities was just came under $320 billion. That means people gave more, they ate, spent money on fast food than they gave to charity. Did you know that the average American gives 2.5% of their gross income to their church? That's kind of mind-boggling when you know that the Bible gives a definition that, that we're to, at a minimum to give our tithe. And, you know, I know someone's going to stop me on the way out. They say, well, Pastor, I want you to know uh, the tithe was in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. I, I don't believe we ought to give the tithe. I think we, yeah, and I agree with you, we shouldn't give the tithe. Grace giving is emphasized in the New Testament. Grace giving is more than the tithe. Every time I tell somebody that who argues about the tithe, they oh, yeah, that's right, you know. 
But the Bible speaks about a topic that's very sensitive, very private to a lot of people there. But he's speaking about the fact that, you know, as you watch these two groups of people give, he said, money talks. Just previously to this and the previous verses, we were here the last three, four services, we saw our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, just these, 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 religious, these religious people who were enemies of his, the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, and the Herodians, they tried to discredit Jesus, they tried to embarrass him, they tried to entrap him, they tried to get him in trouble with the Roman government. Each of them failed, Jesus called them out. And now we get to verses, chapter 20, verses 45 to 47, and Jesus, before he makes this, he call, he, 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 we get into chapter 21, he calls out the scribes, he calls out these religious leaders, he calls them out on their pride. He calls them out on their, 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 their showmanship, or their ostentatiousness, as we would say it there. He says, beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long, new robes. And they love to be in the marketplace where people greet them, they, where someone will say, hello, rabbi so-and-so, hello, rabbi so-and-so there. And they, they lavish greetings in the marketplace. And when they go into the synagogues, they want the highest seats so that people can see them. They can be recognized. They want to be recognized. They, he's condemning their pompousness. He's condemning their pride. He's condemning the fact that when they went to feast. They wanted the closest seats to the host. They wanted the chief seats in the host. And then he gets in the next verse, verse 47, and he talks about them, about devouring widows' houses. And he's really just talking about the fact that they befriended widows and they took advantage of the most, the most, uh, the most uh, disadvantageous people in society, the people that were most vulnerable, widows, and took advantage of them. And to just basically, uh, in some cases, they even took their homes, if you would. And then they, he talked about how they would stand up in public places and they would give long prayers to try to impress people with their eloquence and their words. He's condemning these people, and as he's doing so, as I said earlier, Jesus is standing there in this place called the Court of the Women, and he's making some observations about how money talks. Notice number one, we notice as we get to chapter 21, we see a time of collection. Here Jesus is standing there in the Court of the Women. There's a long processional of men making their financial donations. In the court of the women, they had 13 trumpet-shaped collection or offering boxes. These offering collection boxes were basically boxes at the base, but built up on top of it, it was shaped like trumpets. They'd have a opening at the top, a very small opening and a very, a very narrow neck, if you would, that enlarged itself as it went down. But the opening of every one of these trumpet, these trumpet, these trumpet shaped connect collection boxes were large enough so that people could put their coins into their offering. Now, rich men, when they gave, they gave uh, heavy, uh, what we would call heavier types of metal. They would give gold and silver, which were the heaviest metals. They would give their denarii and their shekels. And the size of those metals would, would, could be determined by the sound that they made every time they would deposit this coin, this, this whatever it may be, inside the opening there of this trumpet-shaped collection box. So it had a di very distinguishable sound. You knew a gold coin went into that box when the gold coin was dropped. And you knew a silver coin went in when a silver coin was dropped. And you knew when a denarii went in when a denarii was dropped. And you knew when a shekel went in when a shekel was dropped. And if you can imagine with me, Jesus is standing here, he's standing here on the side watching what's going on. He's just, he's just dropped a bomb on the Pharisees, Sadducees, and on the Herodians. It's that same group of men, among others, who are standing there in their long robes and their expensive robes. It's the time, it's, it's the week of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's the time, one of the, the few feast days of the year, when all the Jews were supposed to come from all over, uh, all over the Middle East to celebrate the Passover or celebrate later on the, the Feast of Pentecost or another time, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so Jews have come from everywhere. You've got the local Jews, which are many that lived in Jerusalem. You had Jews that lived on the outskirts in the towns of Judah. Then you had the Jews that came from afar, from different places, maybe like Syria, or maybe like places wherever there were Jewish synagogues. They would board a ship or where they travel long distance, and they arrived there. All the Jews have come into Jerusalem. Everyone's there. They're in anticipation of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Passover, which will be starting just in a couple of days from them. And there is 
because they're there, they're, they, and, 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 and the leaders there of Israel love these days. They love those feast days because those were days when they, they would get the collections and there'd be a, a, a larger amount of money that they would collect that would help finance the treasury needs and finance the temple needs, particularly there, all the temple needs they have. And of those 13 boxes that would be lined up there, they'd be lined up one next to the other. They all looked the same. They had the cylinder type of shape of shaped trumpet. They all would be right there next to each other. You'd have box number one, box number two, box number three, all the way going over to box number 13. And every one of them had a title next to them. Uh, some of those titles, if I can give them to you, some of the titles that they had, according to the mission, was one box would say, the new shekel dues. And another one would say, the old shekel dues. And another one would say, this is for the bird offering. And another one would say, this is the young birds for the whole offering. And another box would say, this is for the wood offering. And this is for the frankincense. And then you'd have six boxes, which basically were labeled the free will offerings. Now these boxes were all labeled so that people could distinguish where exactly they were going to put their gifts. Because these were gifts over and above their tithe. These were gifts that they were giving to demonstrate that they're concerned for the needs of the temple and the needs of, uh, if you would, for the, the work of God there. And so if you can imagine with me, here are, these, here are these rich men, because Jesus is noticing the rich men. All the rich men are lined up. You knew they were rich men by their long flowing robes. And you knew they were rich men as they stopped at these particular boxes and they would drop in coins. You knew the sound of a gold coin and you would know the sound of a silver coin and you would know the sound of a shekel and you would know the sound of a denaria as these coins are being dropped in there. You could hear the sound, the clanging of that noise there. Now you and I know enough about, about money. We realize this, that, that pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters, and, 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 and silver dollars, they're, they're, you know, uh, dollars, uh, dollar coins, that they all are different shapes and they all have a different weight. The least of perhaps of all of them are perhaps the penny because it's made out of copper. And honestly, if, if today, if there was a penny on the floor, uh, maybe some here today might pay attention to it and pick up the penny. But if you're like me, I've walked many times where I've been on the sidewalk, I've been walking somewhere. I've been engaged in conversation with someone. Maybe I'm talking to my wife or maybe I've got one of my granddaughters with me. I'm talking to them and I might see a penny and I'm just not inclined to pick up the penny. But brother, I'm telling you what, if there's a quarter there, amen. If there's a dollar bill there, amen. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you, some of you had a little $5 bill there. You didn't know you dropped it when you gave your offering. You, you meant to keep your pocket, but you dropped it. And I guarantee you, if you drop that $5, I'm a preacher. I'm going to pick it up. Amen. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to look for it there. Amen. My dad told me this years ago. We had a store. He said, Dad, always, look. he said, Alan, always look on the floor. I said, why? He said, if you look on the floor, you'll always find money. He was right. Man, I, we'd have customers in that old grocery store he had. They would drop $20 bills and $5. This is back in the 60s. $5 bills and $10 bills. And I'd be walking behind him. I'd pick it up. He said, what did you do? I gave it back to them, of course. Amen. But I want you to know that, you know, we, we, we you know, we, smaller amounts of money, we just don't pay as much attention to the bigger amounts of money. And these rich men, they knew that. They knew that as they stood in line, that there are going to be groups of people, I mean, the rich men ahead and the rich men behind them. Everyone's paying attention to the sound of your coins dropping into these trumpet-shaped collection boxes. Here's one rich man. I'm going to put one in the free will offering box. I'm going, to put it, I'm, going to put a, I'm going to put a gold coin over here for the bird offering. And I'm going to put one, another one here for the wood offering. And I'm going to put another one here for the frankincense. I mean, this is going on for a long extended period of time because the people in the crowds have come into Jerusalem. And there's a large, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of people in Jerusalem there. And you can imagine the lines are going out the door. And they're coming into the court of the women and they're dropping their coins. And everyone standing there probably just used to hearing the, the sound of the quarters, excuse me, the sound of the gold coins, the sound of the silver coins, the sound of the denarii, the sound of the shekels. And then in the midst of all, all this. There's this impressiveness. That everybody's got, man, he, yeah, he put, he, put, he put six gold coins in there. Oh, yeah, he put, he put two gold coins and two silver and two denarii. I mean, everyone's impressed with these amounts because they're listening to see who's out giving the other. In the midst of all this, there's a, a widow woman. How did you know she's a widow woman? Well, I imagine this widow woman, it's because of how the scriptures described her. Her face is weather-worn from the stress of trying to get by day by day. Perhaps a veil over her head. The dress she wears, the robe she wears is the only one she has. She's worn this 365 days the past year and maybe the previous year. Maybe it's the last set of clothes that she ever had after her husband passed away. I imagine that she's a widow woman because there's these two little fatherless children. 
They're next to her. I imagine she's hunched over. I imagine this woman just, just make your way there, and she's just kind of snugged in between one rich man in front of her, another rich man behind her. And this widow woman here, hear all these impressive men dropping in their gold and their silver and their denarii and their shekels. They're dropping their coins and they're making these loud clanging noises going down there. If you ever remember back in the day, if you ever rode an AC transit bus back in the day, there was a day when they would take tokens and change and you'd, pop, you'd put your money inside there and you could see your money going and you could hear the money go inside that. And you could tell if it was a quarter that went in or if it was a dime that was in because a quarter is heavier in weight than a diamond weight. And the same thing was true of, these, of the money that was going at that time. There was gold and silver and denarii and shekels going in. But here's this widow woman. This widow woman is walking just in between there. You can almost think, imagine that the rich men are kind of pushing her along the way. Say, woman, get out the way. Woman, you're going too slow. Woman, would you please go the way? I want to get my offering in there. This woman, woman's making her way and not sure which, which offering she went to. But maybe she went to the box for the bird offering. Because poor, though those who were poor, they didn't have enough money to buy a lamb. And at best they could do, they would buy two little pigeons and they would give their pigeon offering there. And maybe she gave her, her her little thing. But here's the thing we have to be impressed with. Nobody's paying attention to this woman except for Jesus. And I tell you something, you may be hurting. Jesus is watching. In fact, here's something here. Luke says that Jesus saw, and Mark says he saw how. Here's this widow woman, shuffling her feet, veil over her head, shabbily dressed, I mean, I can even imagine that she probably sewed some patches where there were some holes on her dress because that's the only dress she had. She makes her way shorter than those men, reaches up. She's shorter than that, that little trumpet thing, reaches up. And the Bible says she puts in two mites, two little copper coins. Those little copper coins go inside and they snake their way down inside that metal cylinder making a very faint sound in comparison to the gold and the silver and the denarii and the shekels. But you notice that verse there? A certain poor widow woman cast in two mites. The English, the King James English translators used the words might. But for the Jew, the coin was known as a lepta. A lepta in value was less than a penny. It was one fortieth of a shekel, which would make it one twentieth of a Jewish penny. The word lepta literally means this. It's in your notes. The thin one. It was the smallest and the thinnest of all the coins in circulation of that day. The Bible says he saw a certain poor widow casting in two mites. She puts her leptas in. Would you watch this? She puts the first one in without hesitation. She puts the second one in without hesitation. He said, Pastor, why is that significant? Would you look at the next verse? Jesus observed she cast in all her living. Barely made a noise. And by the way, it barely could buy anything. Jesus is watching. Jesus is watching these crowds of people, how they're giving their money to him. He's watching that. It was a time of collection. You know, we have a time of collection in church. I think what we look at here, there's a, the Bible gives us, uh, God, God is a God of order, amen? And, you know, the Jews in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament, has designated times of collection because church services should have structure and organization to it. In the Old Testament, if you look at your Bible there in Malachi 3, 
uh, the Bible tells us that God told his people to bring their tithes and their offerings to him. If you look at Malachi 3.10, it's in your notes. If not, it'll be on the screen or you can turn your Bible in it. And the Lord said, bring ye, notice this word, all the tithes into the storehouse. Now the tithe represents, as we go back to Genesis 14, and we studied again later on in Genesis 28, and again later on in Exodus, and later on in Leviticus, the tithe basically means one-tenth. So the Jews were of all of their, however God prospered them, however God blessed them, they were just set aside one-tenth of that to give the Lord. Now, sometimes it would be money. Sometimes it would be their harvest. Sometimes it would be their oil. Sometimes it would be their freshly squeezed grape juice, whatever it would be. And they had a storehouse they, in the temple. They had a room, a very large room, which was called the storehouse. Now, when we look at the word storehouse, the storehouse describes the church in the New Testament here, okay? But in the Old Testament, here's what he said in Malachi 3.10. He said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open uh, you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So he says, here, you're to bring, we're to bring our tithe into the storehouse, our tithes and our offerings, and to give it to the Lord there. Now, that was the structure, the organizational structure that they had for, for the Old Testament. Now, we fast forward to the New Testament. The church has been established. Jesus has established his church. We go to 1 Corinthians 16. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul makes a statement here. He teaches us how, we are, how we're to do, do the collection or the offerings. Would you notice this? In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. In verse 1, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, so do ye. Now there's a couple things really quick. Uh, what, what Paul gave here as instruction, this was a routine that he did for every church that was established. He established for every church that, they, that, that was birthed, he established for them principles for calling a pastor, principles for teaching God's word. He gave them principles for giving. He gave them principles for collection. Here's what he said there. He says, now for the collection of the saints. In this particular case, this was a specific offering. It was an offering to help uh, believers in other churches at that, because at that time there were, there, many churches were filled with uh, people that were financially destitute and hurting. There were a lot of slaves and orphans and widows in the beginning days of the church that had nothing. And, and so other churches, sister churches took a special offering for them. So he says, I know your goal here is you're, you're you're collecting some money to help the poor saints up in, up in Jerusalem. He says, now for the collection of saints. Now we have designated offerings. We have our tithe and anything over and above the tithe, we call it our offering. We have an offering for missions. We have an offering for our building. We have an offering for other special needs, whatever it may be there. Uh, recently we had our anniversary offering, which thank you for many of you who gave something for the anniversary offering, which is going to be set aside for helping us with uh, some remodeling and some updating we're eventually going to do with the main building there, the first buildings you came to the parking lot. But we have designated offerings. And Paul's saying this, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order, what he told the Corinthians was nothing new, was nothing novel. This was something he had also done with other churches that he started. Those other churches he started were in the area of Galatia. We call Galatia, Galatia in that time is modern day Turkey now. And he did that in northern Turkey. He did that on the, on the western side of Turkey. He did that on the eastern side of Turkey, wherever they had churches. He established this. And he said this in verse 2. He said, verse 1, he says, now, he says, I've given order for, for, for our offerings. And he said in verse 2, upon the first day of the week. Now, the first day of the week is Sunday. We're on the first day of the week. He said, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you, he's saying now, every one of you who's a believer, every one of you who knows you're saved, every one of you, you've trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior, and you've been baptized in that church. He says, now let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now, Paul's giving structure. He's saying, the matter of giving is this. Number one, we're, we, we are to prepare ourselves for giving. And the preparations we lay by us in stores, God has prospered. We look at however you get paid, however you got a distribution, however God prospered you, you're to consider that and lay, lay, lay aside what you're going to give. You're premeditating your mind and heart what you're going to give. We need to prepare ourselves to give. That's what laying by him in store means. That means as we approach coming to the Lord's house, we lay by ourselves in store ready to give. Now that means whether you give physically into the bag offering or you give electronically through the, through the, through the uh, uh, online giving, and you might do it before church or after church, the, the fact of the matter is, is on the Lord's day, we're to lay by ourselves in store. We're to be prepared to give. Number one, we're to be prepared. Number two, we're to be willing. Now, we, we're to be willing to communicate. Now, you're going to find in the New Testament a word, this word communicate is used frequently. Now, when we use communication, communicate, we're talking about verbally talking to one another or writing to one another. We're talking about expressing ourselves. The word communicate does mean that. 
But the word communicate in the New Testament also has the idea or the implication of fellowship and fellowship through our financial gifts for the work of God. And communicate's important word. It means to collectively bring our offerings. It means the fellowship of sharing together through our offerings. Galatians 6, 6 says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now all that is saying there is you, you find your church, which is heritage, that you're blessed in, where God is feeding your soul, and this is maybe where you got saved, and this is maybe where you've made your major decisions for God, and God's working your life, then the Bible says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth. In other words, you're to consider that you're to fellowship with the pastor, and you're giving your offerings to the Lord there. Just before we started church, I made sure I went on the online platform, made sure I gave my offering this morning to the Lord, gave my tithe and my offering for that. We're to communicate in, in that. He says, let him communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. We're to come with the willingness to communicate. Number three, we must not only be prayer ourselves, we must be, number two, be willing to communicate. Then notice Philippians 4. Philippians 4 says something about communication. Uh, Paul, when he wrote Philippians chapter 4, was writing about giving to missionaries. And Paul was the missionary specifically here in this case. And Paul is giving us the principles, what we call faith promise missions. In Philippians 4 verses 14 to 15, he says, notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also then the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Now what's he saying there? Okay, Paul's saying this, okay? He started the church in Philippi. That's it. That was a colony of Macedonia. He started this church. He got the church going. They had a meeting place. They had a congregation. He taught them giving. He taught them how to organize church service, okay? The Lord moves him from Philippi. He's still in the Macedonia region, but now God moves him to a neighboring city called Thessalonica. When he's down there at Thessalonica, Paul realized that while he was there, he didn't have a lot of money. He ran out of money very quickly there. The church at Philippi recognized that Paul had this need there, and they said, that's our pastor. That's our missionary. We sent him out of our church. He, came under, he went out on the authority of the church at Philippi. We need to take up an offering. So that's why Paul's saying in Philippians 4.14, ye did well that ye communicated to me in my affliction. What was his affliction? His affliction was, listen, he had some days he didn't eat. He had some days he had nowhere to stay. He had some days where basically he had financial needs for the church. He had some things he wanted to do. He had some Bibles he wanted to give to people. And he had, he had what he called an affliction. He had a need there. And see, so he said, these Philippian believers, God touched their heart. They took up an offering over and above what their church need was. And they communicated with Paul in their affliction. And he says, I want you to know, there are other churches that I started that were before you. There was the church at Antioch of Pisidia. And there was a church at Iconium. And there was a church there, if you would, on the island of Cyprus there. There were other churches he started. But none of those churches took up offerings. None of them communicated with me. And he's commending the church at Philippi for saying, ye did well in that you communicated with me in my time of affliction. He said, for no other church communicated with me, but you also. Now he's not condemning or chastising the other churches. He's just commending the church at Philippi. He's just saying, thank you for caring. Thank you for taking up the offering. Thank you for being biblical. Thank you for being giving. I mean, that's what he was just saying there. So they took up this offering and they sent it to Paul. The word communicate means we need to be willing to communicate. We must be prepared to give. But notice something else. We must be ready to give. Now, all of this is mind and heart preparation. Preparation, willingness, Readiness. Paul told the believers at the church at Ephesus when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, he said this. Now, here's what you need to do. He said, I want you to tell the congregation they're to be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. There's a time of collection. Jesus sees and he observes. Jesus, don't think that Jesus doesn't see. Now, nobody else is paying attention to your giving. Nobody else should take, pay attention to your giving. But Jesus pays attention to our giving, amen? Jesus is watching what we're doing. We see a time of collection. But notice number two, this is the part I want you to miss. Notice number two, we see a test of comparison. Now, here's these two groups that have given. We've seen these rich men and, and the offering is still going on. We have these rich men dropping their gold and their silver, their denarii and their shekels, and this widow woman just kind of wedges herself in between two rich men and drops in two little thin copper coins that are called leptas. Here's what Jesus said. Are you there? Look at verse 3. Because previous to this, in the previous chapter, He's spoken out against the malfiants 
the mischievous deeds, the dishonesty, the fraud, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. And he said in verse 3, of a truth, I say to you that this poor widow has cast in all the living that she had. Now, verses 3 and 4, Jesus is making a comparison. This comparison is twofold. First of all, he's making comparison of the size of the offerings. He said, she has cast in more than they all. That's talking about quantity. Now, we're scratching our heads because that sounds paradoxical, doesn't it? How can you, Jesus, you don't know your math. No, he does, amen? Jesus, how could you say, Jesus, you don't know weights and measures. How can you say these two little thin copper coins that this woman put in is more than what they gave? Then the rich men gave of their gold and their silver and their denarius. In fact, she gave two little shekels. Most of those men gave four to six of their monies there. Two little, she gave two little, little pennies there. But, you, but here's what Jesus said. Notice in verse, verse, verse 3. He said, of a truth. Now, these we people that were standing there he's speaking to were used to seeing the hypocrisy. They were used to seeing the deceitfulness. They are used to seeing the lies. They are used to seeing all this, 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 uh, this devious activity. He says, I want you to know in the midst of all this, there is truth. Of a truth means I'm not exaggerating. Of a truth means absolute in fact. Of a truth means I want you to know that in a world where there's fraudulent behavior, where there's these men standing in front and behind this woman that are giving to show off their wealth, they've given of their abundance, but she's given of her all. I want you to know I really see and know what's going on. He says of a truth, I truthfully know what's going on in each person's heart when it comes to giving. You remember years ago, the U.S. economy was concerned about the disclosures lenders were making when it came to giving, when it came to borrowing, uh, for borrowers and borrowing money. And they were concerned that there would be hidden fees and, and fine print and things that the average borrower would not know about. So they came out with what we call the truth in lending statement. The truth in lending laws. And anytime you borrow money, you're going to get some kind of documentation that conforms to the truth in lending laws, basically saying that that lending institution conforms to all that. Why did they do that? They did that because there was a lot of fraudulent activity going on, and there were unscrupulous lenders that were got fined substantially for being, de uh, dis uh, you know, for being uh, uh, devious in that way there. And so our Lord is just saying here, I just want you to know, we don't have truth in lending laws and truth in giving laws, but he says, I want you to know, of a truth, I see what's going on. Of a truth, I want to tell you, I tell you the truth, whether the giving is truthful or the giving is fraudulent. And he sees this woman putting things in, and he says, of a truth, I want you to know, this poor widow, and that's kind of an interesting thought, compared to those rich men, she was very poor. I mean, she was very destitute. I mean, she had nothing compared to them. In fact, her, her offering wouldn't even make a dent in anything, would not make any difference for that treasury or make any difference for the temple. He said, of a truth, this poor widow has cast in more than they all. And what he's saying is this, listen, when you look at what they gave in comparison to what she gave, it may seem the amount they gave was more, but she, but the Bible says here, in size, this poor widow has cast in more. Why? Because she cast in all when they cast in of their abundance. When Warren Buffett donated $541 million of stock, that's just, that's just a drop in the bucket for him. He gave of his abundance. When James Simon gave $500 million to Stony Brook College and University, that's just a drop in the bucket. Why? Because he gave of his abundance. When all of us give, we give for the most part out of our abundance. Now, we need to thank God we are blessed. Amen? Right. I mean, let's thank God this morning. We've got jobs. If you've got savings... Uh, if you've got, you know, if you've got, you know, you've got a car or two and you're able to pay your bills and, and you know, you're able to get your, get your kids to college, things like that. I mean, just, you ought to thank God you have that ability. You thank God you have the ability to pay for your health insurance. You thank God for the ability to buy your groceries. Thank God that you can go on vacation. I mean, we ought to thank God for what we have. But listen, whenever we give something, for the most part, we're not very few, very, very few, most people, in fact, I'm talking the majority of the population, probably 99% of the population, we give of our abundance. We don't give our all. And Jesus said in comparison, I want you to test the comparison. This woman, she gave all of her living. In terms of size, she gave all of her living. But notice something else. Jesus not only compared the size, notice Jesus made a comparison of the sacrifice. 
They gave of their abundance. Now, now he wasn't taking away what they gave. And he wasn't discounting the amount that they, they gave. He wasn't appreciative of it. He wasn't saying that. He was saying that they, they gave of their abundance. In other words, whatever they gave, they still had a lot more to draw from. They still had a lot more. That, I mean, whatever they did was not, was not going to hurt them. It didn't make that big a difference. But this woman, he's saying, now, as you watch these men come by, and they're dropping their gold coin, their silver coin, their denarii, and their shekel, and they're just making their way across the way there. And maybe some, maybe some put in a gold coin in every one of those 13 collection boxes. Here's this little widow woman, barely making a difference, dropping in two leptas. Two leptas basically were almost absolutely nothing. He says, you know what she did? Look at verse 4. She, of her poverty or penury, has cast in all the living she had. What does that mean? Would you fathom this for just a minute? That widow woman could have come to that one, whichever collection box she went to, and she could have paused up, you know, this is all I've got. All her living means, once she put the money in there, there'd be no food for several days maybe several weeks. They didn't have welfare. They didn't have social security. They didn't have government aid. They didn't have, they didn't have the county of Alameda do something. They didn't have a Governor Newsom that signed off a billion-dollar homeless thing. They didn't have any homeless benefits. They didn't have anything of those days. There was no government help at that time. In fact, if anything, the government threw you under the bus at that time. She didn't have any of that. She, what she gave when she gave her living, she gave her food money, she gave, or perhaps maybe if she had to pay rent, her rent money. I mean, when the Bible says she gave her living, basically she had, she basically gave everything. She, she didn't have any reserve. She didn't have any backup. She didn't have what most financial advisors tell you. You have three months of your spending, your expenditures to set aside as an emergency reserve. She didn't have a reserve fund. She didn't have an emergency fund. She didn't have any family. She didn't have anybody else. She didn't have any sons who were old enough to take care of her. She cast in everything she had. She put in all her living. But why did she do that? Well, she could have thought this. I, maybe I'll just put one in and hold back the other. She she didn't do that. Jesus watched this woman. She gave. She sacrificed. She gave. By the way, she gave with a loving spirit. She gave with a generous heart. Here are these men that are going in. You can imagine their, their thoughts. You know, I could use this gold coin to buy something else. I could use this silver coin to buy something else. But they gave it because by the sound of that coin going in, they wanted to impress the guy behind them and maybe impress the guy in front of them that just gave. This little widow woman, she didn't impress anybody. But the Bible says Jesus saw what she gave because of her penury. She is cast in more than all of they. Listen, the temple was no richer, but she was immeasurably more poor after what she gave there. Real sacrifice is something that costs us. It costs this woman. But did you think about this? What kind of spirit did she have when she gave? I mean, do you think she gave begrudgingly? Do you think she gave with reservation? I don't think so. I think this woman, she gave, what impressed Jesus was the attitude and the spirit and the mode of her giving. Because 2 Corinthians 9, 7 tells us this. It says this, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And the word cheerful has the idea of just giving with a, with just, you know, with where you're just, you're just, you're just, you're laughing. It's, it's not humorous, but you're just, wow, man, this is so great. I get to give. This is so wonderful. And the, the spirit that this woman came with, you know, she had a heart. She fulfilled what the Shema says in the Old Testament. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. And she just dropped in those coins, those two little copper coins, and she gave out of a heart that's loving and a heart that was filled with joy because she loved her Lord. Amen? Amen. He does a test of comparison he makes a tremendous commendation. Look at verse 4 again. Jesus is not attacking the rich men. He's not attacking you and me. But what he is saying, he's elevating the spirit of giving, the heart of giving. And he says, look at this poor widow woman. All these have their abundance cast into the offerings of God, but she of her penury has cast in all the living that she had. If you knew that all you had left were two little copper coins, would you have dropped that into one of those collection boxes? Or would you have withheld it? 
Or would you have decided, I won't go to church that day? And all Jesus is telling us here, her gift reflected her love for God. It showed her motive, the great motive she had in giving, this attitude of giving joyfully and lovingly to the Lord. He makes a tremendous commendation. You know, the Lord observes what we're doing. And he loves us when we have an attitude for giving. He says, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down and running over, shall men pour into your bosom. We're to have this spirit of giving. But notice lastly as we close this morning, would you notice this? We see a time of collection, a test of comparison. We see this tremendous commendation. Would you notice some truthful conclusions? Let me give you some thoughts. We want to wrap it all together and end it up here. The giving was done. Jesus made this very powerful statement, verses 3 and 4. The spotlight is on this poor widow woman who's hunched over, shabbily dressed, veil over her head, maybe two little orphan, two little fatherless children with her, shuffling her way along, approaching that offering box, putting her two offerings in, maybe with a joy in her heart and a smile on her face, and just thanking the Lord she had the opportunity to give, and she just resumes her way, and right behind her comes a loud, clanging noise of someone else, this rich man putting his gold coin in, his silver coin in, his denarii and shekel, all of that going on. It's almost like everybody else around her just didn't even pay attention to her, but Jesus paid attention to her. Right. So let me give you some conclusions. Number one, would you write this down? First of all, giving is godly. Amen? Amen? Right. Somebody help me with that. Amen? Right. Giving is godly. Okay, we are most like God when he gives. Did you know God is giving? Yes, he is. He gave you life. That's why you're here this morning. He gives you salvation. Okay? He gives you mercy. He gives you pardon. He gives you life, amen? He gave you the relationship you have in life, okay? God is giving. So God, giving is godly. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible says, you know, in, in, in the area of worship, Psalms 29.1, it says give. Give unto the Lord. Give unto the Lord glory and praise. Uh, to not give is sin and selfishness. And I want to ask you a question, not to make you uncomfortable, not to make you feel guilty, but do you tithe? Do you, make, do you give offerings? Do you set aside systematically? Do you lay by yourself in store as the Lord's prosper you? Or is online giving kind of prompted you just to, when you, when you think about it, you'll do it? I told our staff months ago in the deacons, I said, a couple years ago, I said, we get back to weekly offerings because we need to be biblical about it. Well, regardless of how many people and a good percentage of our, of our congregation does online giving, which I'm thankful for, but I said, we need to have this in our mind that we never should divest the, area, the, mat, the matter of giving from the worship of God. Giving is godly. We need to get back to tithing. We need to get back to giving. And listen, there's two groups of people. Either you need to get back to tithing and get back to giving, which I encourage you to do, or if you've never done it, I want to encourage you to start tithing and start making offerings. Why? Because the Bible says when you start tithing, he says, prove me now herewith that I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you can't receive. You need to try God, okay? Number one, giving is godly. Number two, would you write this down? The Lord sees the motive in which we give. Now, tomorrow's April 15th. And tax returns are due, right? And some of you are on extension. Some of you maybe already filed your taxes on time, whatever it may be. Some of you are just sweating bullets. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. And so either, either you're getting back a refund and you've got a smile on your face, you get a refund, or you've got more money you've got to pay, you know, or you've got to make estimated taxes, whatever it may be. It's what it is. Do you know something? Whether it's through your payroll deduction or if you have to write a check or if you do an electronic payment of your tax, do you know something? Listen. The IRS doesn't care about your attitude when you give. They don't care if you're angry with them. They don't care if you're mad at them. I am. Amen, you know. Amen, okay. They don't care about our attitude. I mean, by the way, if you, if you love to pay your taxes, God bless you. I want to meet you. Amen. April 15th is when you go, ouch. They don't care about your attitude, but God cares about our attitude when we give. Amen? Okay? Listen, listen to this, okay? Paul commended the churches of Macedonia. The church at Philippi we read about earlier is from Macedonia. You know what he said about them? Listen to this. This is 2 Corinthians 8.2. How that in a great trial of affliction, in other words, they were going through difficulties, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty 
abounded unto the riches of liberality. So here's what's going on. It was a known fact the churches in Jerusalem were having financial trouble. Because, well, actually, the believers in the churches of Jerusalem were having financial trouble. They, uh, there was a famine. There was economic, just economic hard times. And much of the church of Jerusalem in the early days uh, were made up of believers, converts, who were slaves. You know, they didn't make a whole lot of money. Uh, widows, orphans, people that were just financially disadvantaged. And so it was a known fact that uh, these people were hurting. And the church wanted to help these people, but they didn't have the means. So other sister churches got concerned about that, and some of them took offerings. The very first one mentioned is the church at Antioch of Syria, which was north of Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas were up there. They took up a special offering. In fact, Barnabas and Paul, they delivered that offering because they wanted to be a blessing to them. Well, later on, that practice continued throughout, all of, throughout the churches in Christianity at that time, the first century. And so the church of the Macedonia, which was the church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica, the church of Berea, and other churches like that, they took up these special offerings. And here's what Paul said. These churches themselves were also going through a time of affliction, but in spite of that, they had a joy. There was an abundance of joy in spite of their deep poverty, and they gave liberally in the special offering offering to give to the church of Jerusalem. So in other words, they gave of their ability, but they gave, in spite of the fact that they were taking away from their needs, they gave of what they had to help somebody else that was hurting. He said, the spirit of giving there is the spirit of a cheerful giver there. So our giving, our motive, number two, our motive, the Lord sees the motive in which we give. Number three, quickly, giving that pleases God is giving that must cost us. David said this when he had to make an offering for the Lord for something he did that was bad. He went up to Mount Moriah where the temple would be built one day and there was a man by the name of Arona. He had a threshing floor there. He was threshing his wheat and Paul, uh, David goes and says, I need to buy, I buy this, this, this plot of land from you and the man recognized that that was his king. He said, no, David, he says, I'll give it to you. He says, he says man, I'll give this to you for the offering. I'll give you the wood and all that. I mean, it would have been great for David to say, well, I'm king. You can give it to me. I'll take it. David didn't do that. David said, no, 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 no. He says, I'm coming to give this as an offering to the Lord. I'm buying this. He says, I will not give to the Lord that which does cost me nothing. Sacrifice, listen, listen, okay. Giving, biblical giving, will sometimes cost us. Number four. By the way, the poor widow, it cost her, she gave all her living, amen? But number four, I love this one. God does great things with small offerings. Money does talk. Her gift seemed insignificant, but the Lord saw it, and guess what? Her example was so powerful, it's been preached on for 2,000 years. The Lord took a snapshot of this and put it in Luke 21 and Mark chapter 12, I think it is, for us to remember that. And so significant was this gift. That's what's being preached on this morning. I like what Kent Hughes said. He says, if there is love and sacrifice on the part of the giver, there will be spiritual power in the gift. That's powerful. Remember the, remember the lad? Jesus wanted to feed the multitudes, 5,000 plus people. He says, uh, he says go, go give them bread to eat. They said, well, how are we going to feed such a great multitude? And then Andrew brought this little boy. This little boy said, hey, I've got, five little, I've got five little biscuits and I've got two little fishes, my little happy meal, amen, you know. And he said, I'll give that to Jesus. And somebody else would have scoffed and says, five little biscuits, five little barley loaves. Two little anchovy fishes, what's that going to do among so many? Jesus blessed and he fed a multitude and they had leftovers, amen? Right. Did you know her motive helps us have foresight so that when we stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to look at our gold, silver, precious stones and our wood, hay, and stubble. He's going to test all of our works by fire. Her motive was because she loved the Lord. I promise you, that was gold, silver, and precious stones. It wasn't two little mites. It was gold, silver, and precious stones. Then finally, would you consider one last thing? The timing of this incident could have been our Sunday, or at the latest, Monday. In about two or three days would be the Passover. Jesus Christ was our Passover. Jesus Christ died for our sins. 
just a couple days later. Did you know something? That little woman had no idea of this, but she gave all her living. She was helping people that were there to recognize in just a couple days, Jesus Christ would give all his life for the sins of the world. The greatest sacrifice given was when Christ gave his life to die on the cross for your sins and mine. And you know what? He gave his life joyfully because the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Christ joyfully died for your sins and mine. When he died on the cross, it was essential Christ had to die for our sins so that our sins would be paid for in full and God's forgiveness would be available and you could have the gift of eternal life. That woman gave of all her living not realizing she was pointing to Christ who would give all his life for you and me. Number one, if you're not, if you're not a cheerful giver, I would encourage you to start giving to the Lord. Try to find a way. Start tithing. Get back to tithing. Participate in the offerings. But number two this morning, look at your heart. Your motive is because you love the Lord. It's going to cost you. You can do something that's bigger than you for the Lord. Number three, would you look at the gift Jesus Christ made for you? If you're not saved this morning, if you're not 100% sure your sins are forgiven and you're going to heaven, I invite you this morning in this service to come to know Christ as your Savior, to open your heart and receive Jesus Christ today to be your Savior, to take away your sins and give you the gift of eternal life.